So welcome to the 2023 Mental Health Summit's Living with Depression panel. In this thought-provoking panel, experts and influencers from the adult content creation community come together to address the often overlooked issue of depression within the industry. The discussion will delve into the unique challenges faced by individuals working in the adult industry, exploring the impact of societal stigma, online harassment, and the blurred boundaries between personal and professional life. Panelists will share personal experiences, shedding light on the emotional toll that can accompany a career in this field. The conversation aims to foster a supportive environment, encourage an open dialogue about mental health, destigmatizing depression, and exploring potential solutions for creating a healthier and more compassionate community. Let's jump right in. So I want to make sure every one of our panelists gets a chance to introduce themselves to the group. So to keep this um, brief, how we're going to do it is everyone just share your name and then one reason that you are a part of this panel on living with depression, and then we'll go through the rest of our questions. So I believe we have everyone here, it looks like. Carly, why don't you go ahead and start us off? Hi, thank you so much for having all of us today. Uh, I'm Carly David. I am the founder and CEO of PS Group, which is a marketing agency for the adult industry. We are for sex workers, by sex workers. And I am here today because the only thing that got me through high school was that book, Prozac Nation. Love that. Thank you. Finn, why don't you go next? Hi, I'm Finney, and um, I'm a performer and content creator, and it's just, it's not a topic that's discussed a lot, and it's something that we all, for the most part, deal with regularly in this industry, so yeah, first chance I could, you know, pop in this conversation, you know, I definitely took it. Wonderful, thank you, Finney. Anna, why don't you go next? Hi, everybody. I am Anna Fox. I am a performer, producer, content creator. Um, and the reason I'm here is because I don't think I know a person on earth uh, that doesn't deal with depression. <laughs> so, yay. Lovely. Thank you. Sabian. Hi, my name is Sabian Demonia. I'm also a producer, content creator, um, Kamga, and everything else, really. <laughs> Uh, and I'm here because of, uh, first and foremost, I'm very proud ambassador of uh, Pineapple Support. And second, I'm also using the uh, therapy very intensely in last few months, especially because of the many uh, situations in my private life. And I would like to talk about it and like shed some light on the, you know, opportunities for us as a sex workers uh, that we have with uh, Pineapple Support. Thank you, Sabian. Laura. Hi, I'm Laura Desiree. I'm a content creator, producer, performer, uh, activist, journalist, and brand strategist with PS Group. Um, thank you for, for hosting this and inviting so many of us. Uh, I'm, I'm here because I live with depression and I don't think it's anything we need to be quiet about or anything we should be quiet about or anything that we should be ashamed about. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Laura. Arania. Hi there. Thank you very much for having my, me. Sorry, I'm all tongue-tied. It's been a long day. My name is Arania Mactans. I'm a content creator and a performer producer. And I've been part of Pineapple since the beginning. And I believe that everyone has the right and should all talk about mental health because we all have a mind. And I believe we can all suffer from um, health problems with our mind as well. So it's something we should all be talking about. Thank you, Eva. Hello everybody, my name is Eva. I'm a almost former car model. I didn't stream since March, haven't streamed uh, for the one reason because I'm applying for the master's degree in cyber psychology. So this is actually is the reason why I am here now on this panel, because it's kind of becoming a professional interest to me. But I can say that probably I'm that person that didn't face in her personal life a depression. And that's probably a second uh, reason why I'm here. I am blessed with a personal high level of self-regulation. So I never faced it, but I can 
because of that, I can share some experience of how it is to use those self-regulation skills for yourself. Thank you, Demora. Hi, everyone. I am Demora Evers. Um, I'm here because I live with depression and anxiety, always have, but also uh, my mental health is how I got my start in the adult industry. So I just, not only am I hoping that I can help other people, but I'm going to be using this information to hopefully get some knowledge for myself as well. Thanks, Tamara. And lastly, Nigel. I was just here for the presentation. I thought so. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I didn't have you on my list as a panelist, but they put you on here. So welcome, Nigel. We're glad to have you. I won't call on you anymore, I promise. Well, let's jump right in. So how this is going to work is there'll be certain questions that I call on certain panelists. And then I also want to give opportunity for other folks to, to share their perspectives. We won't be able to hear from each panelist on each question because we unfortunately don't have the time. And so panelists, if you feel like you have something to contribute, you want to share to a question, please just raise your hand in the chat and I'll call on you. Know that I won't be able to call on each person for every question, but I'll do our best to diversify the respondents to each question. So I want to start out with, um, start this panel out with discussing how does depression show up in the adult entertainment industry? So Finn, I want to, I want to start with you as one of our advocates for mental health in the sex work community. How does it show up in your experience and the people that you've been surrounded by? Um, it shows up very randomly, kind of like very unpredictably. Like sometimes you just hit with situations to where you feel overwhelmed, you feel helpless and there you go um yeah i don't know it's 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 kind of that time of year for me as well and um i have been like heavily um doing the therapy once a week thing we're able to like check in as ambassadors and um typically i was doing it like once a month but it's that time of year for me that personally i got to do it once every week but just speaking from personal experience, like it just, it just, it comes in waves. Um, sometimes I could be having a great day and then it just comes out of nowhere. Um, I could see something that reminds me of something that puts me in a bad headspace. Um, it can happen in dreams, daydreams, just, um, uh, yeah, I mean. Thank pretty, you, Finney. I think you had I think you had two amazing points. One, that it shows up really differently for everyone. It can come randomly. The symptoms can look different for each individual. And two, that sometimes there's certain times of the year or certain situations that we might find our depression exacerbated. For a lot of people, that does go based on the seasons, right? It can also go based on the holidays. So I want to make note of kind of the time of year that we're in. Is there certain times of the year in certain situations we might find depression worse for some people? like to hear from one other. What's another perspective on how depression can show up? Awesome. Laura, let's hear from you. I find that in my own experience, depression can be quite invisible as something that you can detect on another person or being experienced by someone else. Um, but though it's invisible to others, my goodness, it can be paralyzing and heavy and uh, a, a headspace of lethargy for an individual who's dealing with it. And a lot of the times, you can perhaps uh, suspect it in the form of uh, a, an, an inability to communicate or express oneself, having a lack of words to, to really convey feelings. Um, there's also the option of disassociation, which of course is a, a bit of an avoiding headspace that I know a lot of us are likely familiar with when the depression gets really heavy. And, you know, that shows up in a performative, okayness and an overwhelming okayness that is often insincere because we are dealing with something that is so profound and so heavy that we need an escape into a, another headspace and personality. Thanks, Laura. I love that you commented on how sometimes it can be invisible. And I think that's really particular to this industry is that people may be performing, they may be going along with their days, they may be seemingly fine. But for some folks, these symptoms show up in really subtle ways. And so being aware of that. So that leads me into to question two. We've already touched on it a little bit, but what are some factors that might 
activate depression and that may be specific to the industry or just our personal lives. So Carly, I want to, I want to start with you. What are some factors that might activate depression? Um, I definitely, for me, it's a difficult thing to answer in like a black and white way, simply because my depression is very long standing, very chronic, very genetic. And so I do find that it kicks up around circumstances or maybe anniversaries sometimes will trigger things. But when I start feeling that sense of, I'm not really interested in life anymore. I just feel uh, just uncomfortable in my own skin and I want to sleep more or eat less or I just don't find the joy as much in things that truly bring me joy. I think that's usually the first sign that I need to look at how I'm taking care of myself whether that be getting enough sleep, eating the right foods, getting exercise, all those things that you're like, yeah, I know I'm supposed to do that. But I think a lot of it is self-care. And in this industry, we're conditioned to go, go, go. And the more you go, the less you pay attention to those warning signs. Yeah. Carly, I think that's great because you touched on what can happen in terms of burnout, right? Is that an activating factor, especially in this industry, is you're putting so much of yourself personally and professionally into this work that if we don't take that time to engage in self-care, community care, whatever it looks like for you, that can really activate things like depression and loss of interest, fatigue, a lot of the symptoms you've described. So I'd like to hear from one other panelist on how depression or how it might be activated for you or those around you. I see Sabian. Awesome. Go ahead and share with us. Um, actually, technically, uh, for example, I am a workaholic, like absolutely a workaholic and people pleaser. So um, for me, technically, the uh, moment when I actually face the most of it is the moment when I stop, uh, when there is no stress, there is nothing to actually put the pressure on me when I sit down and and it's kind of weird because uh, it's not really like visible, like we already mentioned. Uh, it's the moment when it hits you, like you wake up one day and technically you feel just like so unmotivated. There is nothing to run after. There is nothing to be like, oh no, I'm sorry, I can't think about myself. I have to start doing this or that because dates, 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 deadlines, deadlines, deadlines. When I don't have deadlines, that's the moment when I sit down and that's the moment when everything just starts to get blurry and fall apart. So um, I guess it's exactly the opposite for, for some people. But um, for me, if I don't have deadlines, that's the moment when I start overthinking. When I start overthinking, everything starts to be very um, unimportant. And when it stops being unimportant, I start to finding like trying to find the reasons inside of me why it's like that because it's possibly my fault and then everything starts to wheeling internally into complete blur and then I end up you know sitting on the couch not replying to anybody's messages for a week straight and just binge watching Netflix like stupid watching some like literally disconnecting from the reality completely um so I guess um a lot of us is regulated by events by um, some sort of like contests, I, I don't know, hours and whatever, whatever. And to be honest, that kind of helps people like me, workaholics, to not go out of the wheel of what you have to do. Because, you know, sometimes sitting down on your ass and stop, you know, focusing on work is the worst thing that can happen. Yeah, thank you, Sabian. You you touched on something really important that sometimes depression is activated by our behaviors or our lack of behaviors, right? So maybe we're behaving, we're putting too much of ourselves into work and we're not taking care of ourselves or we're not engaging in behaviors like self-care, but it can also be activated by our thoughts. So you mentioned when you're overworking or you're doing these things and then you judge yourself. Um, you talk to yourself like, I must've done something wrong. It's my fault that I'm feeling depressed and that can also drive depression too. So thanks for touching on that. I'd like to have one more response to this question and Demora, I see your hand up. So how is, or what are some factors that activate depression? So with my work, I, and sort of bringing in the family side of it as well, because I have five kids. So <laughs> the, 
doing this work, keeping up with everything with fans and just work in general on top of everything with family life and kids and birthdays and appointments and everything else, it gets very overwhelming. And I try really hard to be mom of the year. I try really hard to be Demora of the year, you know, just be great at everything. And whenever you stretch yourself out so thin, you can't, I personally, I can't, I'm sorry, be there for everybody if I can't take time to breathe for myself. And that makes me really upset because I try to be there for all the kids stuff. I try to be there for, you know, for my fans and stuff. And I've had to actually get to the point where I'm like, I can't answer these questions right now. And I, I'll make a post on my OnlyFans or wherever and be like, look, I'm in a mental rut right now. I have to be here for myself the way that I'm normally here for you guys. And I need you to give me that grace. And just things like that, like family is something that is really, really, honestly, the main part of my life. And then the work is secondary because McDonald's is always hiring. Like I will, my kids are going to eat regardless, but I love what I do. So I want to be able to do it all, but in the same way, I'm only one person. And of course, grief helps, but yes, wonderful. I, I just, I feel like bringing the family into it as well, the outside of work life, bring, bringing that in as well is a big, big thing. And then. <laughs> wonderful, Demora. Thank you. You touched on this point of finding a balance, right? And so sometimes when we lose balance between our personal and our professional priorities, that can activate depression. Maybe feeling like you're putting too much of yourself into one area that might be neglecting other areas. So on that note, I wanna talk about ways that we might effectively manage depression. So what are some day-to-day -day strategies like mindfulness or social support that you found effective for yourself or others in this industry? Rainier, I want to start with you as another one of our ambassadors and volunteer liaisons for Pineapple Support. What have you learned about ways to effectively manage depression? Um, I share some of the same sort of traits that Sabian does, in which she's a you know she's a workaholic. She, you know, or, or with myself, I'm I'm always go, and if I don't have something to do, I then I'm overwhelmed with lack of things to do. Um, and then, you know, you, you spin into that, that cycle of, well, what am I doing wrong? Why aren't I busy right now? Why am I not doing this next thing? And ways for me to sort of cope with all this, this overwhelm that I do get, um, I um, figured out something that I've called for myself any worry time. So I'll sit down for that five, 10 minutes that I do actually have that I'm not doing something or um, I will schedule it in my day where, you know, if I'm busy doing something and I'll have one of these negative thoughts come in, I'll say, you know what, that's the worry time. And I'll sit down at my worry time and I will write all these worries down and I will sort of prioritize them, list them in, is this important? Can I do this now? Can I bump this off? This will be another task I can do at another time. And I'll prioritize the worries or the, the, chores that I might have to do or the intentions that I'll have to look through um, and I will try and, and figure them out there and then and if not I will pop them in for another worry time when I can delve deeper into those things so it sounds really bizarre but scheduling myself to think about the things that I need to um, works really well for me yeah um, that's, so that's that, yeah what we tend to do is avoid thinking about the things that are making us anxious or depressed. And this strategy allows us some space to prioritize that. So instead of letting it build up and then this depression shows up in ways that are unanticipated or we can't control, you're taking the liberty to control that and create a space where you can feel and think about those things. So I love that strategy. Finney, it looks like you may have a recommendation as well. Um. Yeah. Um. So I like to do like little things that bring me joy. And like, say like little mini task or so, because like most of the people here, I'm, work, I'm a workaholic too. Um, but like little mini accomplishments daily definitely bring me joy. Um, also making the time to do things that like I personally like or trying something new that I may not know that I like, but pretty much just taking the time for yourself, separating yourself from your industry persona and 
your you, like just pretty much clacking out for a bit and going to do something that brings you joy. And another important thing when it comes to um, tackling depression is also like, if it's something that like you kind of really need to face to move on is having some sort of a empathetic listener in your life, whether that be a professional or a friend, um, family member, a partner, you know, stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. So two key strategies. One, engaging in behaviors that make us feel joy, right? And so depression can feel like a cloud that nothing feels pleasurable, nothing feels enjoyable. And really being intentional about finding some activities, no matter how small they are, that bring you some joy is really important. And I love your recommendation about finding an empathetic listener. It doesn't always have to be a professional. I think the idea of, you know, finding a therapist can feel really daunting, especially in the midst of depression. So maybe that's not where you start. Maybe you start with sharing it with a partner or a coworker or someone that you trust like a mentor. And then once you're feeling a little bit more equipped to maybe get some professional support, that's always going to be there. Thank you. Eva, I wanted to call on you because you had mentioned maybe some strategies that are helpful for you for regulating mood. Any recommendations on things that you can do to manage mood? they were actually were already given the most work the most successful strategy is not just to you know close the the gap close the hole but also to feel the it's 3 a.m here sorry to feel the container with the good things that that's the most effective uh, strategy but also for myself as a representative of a streaming industry, a person who um, regularly sees herself uh, on the screen. I also got some theory. I'm a person who um, feels more less, who feels less anxiety when she has a theory on her background and as, as a support. So knowing some strategies to actually decrease the fatigue levels being on cam also helps. Right. Yeah, I think we don't have time for me to mention them probably, but I'll make a post on my Instagram if someone is interested. Wonderful. I, yeah, we appreciate that. I think any kind of strategies that are specific to the industry and what that might mean to have extra camera time and how to regulate mood in that context are really helpful. Anna, do you have any recommendations on strategies that might help um, effectively manage your depression? Okay. <laughs> Besides uh, things that look like this, um, that? Uh, <laughs> definitely helps manage my stress a lot. Um, I got dogs, I think, uh, I've been in the industry uh, 11 years now, and I decided to get a companion um, five years in just because I felt like I was trauma dumping on my friends and a lot of people would say like, no, it's cool. Go ahead and tell me all this shit. But then you would feel like they're not listening or they're not taking it seriously. And it didn't really feel right. And at the time I wasn't financially able to, you know, get a therapist and things like that. Um, so my dogs really helped me a lot. And then I started making time, no matter what I have to do for the day in the morning, I make sure that I have like my me time, which is bath time for me. I, I take a bath because it takes a lot longer. So I have that time where it's really quiet and it's just me in the water, chilling out, floating, butt naked. And it makes me feel great, honestly. Um, but now, nowadays, um, besides my friends that do listen to me, do care for me and all of those things, I, I found that I had to get the right therapist. Um, I kind of just like Googled therapy and was like, therapy, yay. But um, I found that I needed to find like a trauma therapist and like a sex worker friendly therapist. Um, so I, I do the me time things as as in addition to having a professional help me because as well as I think I'm adulting, uh, I fall short and it's always great to get a second opinion. Yeah, I appreciate that. We have lots of great strategies that people can use on an individual level. 
And sometimes what someone needs is a little bit of additional support from a therapist or a professional. And what's really important is finding someone that's a good fit, someone that understands your intersecting identities, your occupational experiences. And that's really the mission of Pineapple Support is to make sure that folks access the kind of care that they need in a financially accessible way, right? And so for anyone out there who might be toying with the idea, am I ready for therapy? Do I want to give it a try? Pineapple Support can be a really great place to try because folks here are trained to understand understand that experience. They've worked with others in similar circumstances. So thanks for throwing that out there. All right. I want to move on to our next question. And so what I would like to hear for is a, from is a couple executives or producers in the room. Do you have any recommendations for working with, supporting, or managing talent that may be experiencing depression, some of the symptoms that we've described here? Sabian, let's start with you. Okay, since everybody went quiet, I will try to my best to answer that. Um, since I was producing for King.com, so I guess uh, um, it's my duty. Uh, so uh, technically, like we mentioned, sometimes depression is not visible um, and people don't really look depressed when they show up, right? But King's uh, a well-known way of like releasing some sort of tension because you know becoming submissive or uh, going into subspace technically is for, even for me it's pretty therapeutic and it helped to regulate uh, my emotions and being in subspace actually does help tremendously to put my endorphins up uh, so um, the most important thing is um, a aftercare after the scene, but before the scene, checking on your talent, making sure prior, um, if they're fit to be on the set, if it's something what they will be feeling comfortable, making sure their boundaries are respected, making sure that um, everything is well ex explained and um, communicated and ideally uh, trying to fit talents with each, that are actually having very good connection between each other, possibly knowing each other already. So there is a, some sort of level of understanding in between talents that gives them comfort. And like I said, after, after care is extremely important. What I usually tend to do, I feed my talent because I think food is the biggest way to show love. So, you know, it, there's nothing better than being fucked and fed, <laughs> period. So uh, I usually try to take my, my talent for a dinner or even um, cook myself if I have a, a possibility, uh, um, you know, like making it friendly, making it like welcoming, making it feel like a release. And um, because good scene, good, uh, collaboration, good work with each other actually might be extremely helpful for people who have depression because there is nothing better for depression than good orgasm <laughs> uh, in friendly environment, of course. <laughs> You touched on such a great point in that going back to the question about factors that activate depression, you touched on some of those, right? So being in a set where maybe you, you're having challenges around communication or consent or boundaries, or your producer, or your director isn't respecting or asking or checking in, those are all factors that can actually activate depression. So a good prevention. There's nothing strategy. worse. There's nothing yeah. worse to go to the set and be completely just like in the room full of people who don't really even acknowledge that you are a human being or they don't acknowledge you as a person so uh, yeah it's it, it actually that type of situation might might add a lot to mm -hmm. like emotional baggage because for example I was working in a I mean I'm still working in mainstream form and um and the difference between going to the set when you know people and they're like you know open and they talk and they're friendly and whatever and the going to the set where nobody really even look at you, everybody are on their phones and you feel like it's a chore. It kind of felt extremely heavy on my soul to the extent that I was coming back home and I was like, oh my God, I have to just get it out. I have to take my path. I have to like fuck it out of my body because it feels almost like, like, like the heaviness yeah. <laughs> was really... Yeah, I think thank you for sharing that personal experience. I imagine a lot of people can relate to that reaction. 
And I see Laura, you have your hand up. So some additional maybe recommendations for working with supporting and navigating talent that might be experiencing depression or some of the challenges that Sabian described. Sure, um, I'll, I'll keep it brief. I, I produce and direct a lot of the live sex shows in New York City and uh, working with talent, I wanted to feel as equipped as possible with some of the tiny nuanced details that we deal with in those scenarios. And so I went for my intimacy coordination certification. And um, what I got took from that was, you know, the importance of cultivating a, a sense of safety, first and foremost, between all involved. And that means, uh, granting the individuals performing the opportunity to feel as safe as possible to disclose how they might be feeling the day of production or rehearsal or whatever it might be. And I don't believe that a headspace like depression is the safest one to proceed with when we're getting involved in something as can be intense as the physical exchange of sex and performance. And so I, I, I like to make it an open opportunity to check in with them. I don't ever want to assume or accuse someone of you're in a really depressed state right now. I don't think this is a good time for you. I don't ever want to put that on to somebody, but I want them to feel comfortable enough to express that in the words that they can if that's what's happening, because, you know, production can be so fast paced and one of the big statements that still sticks in my mind uh, from for years now has just been that uh, urgency is the death of agency and decisions, especially about our bodies don't need to be made with this countdown clock in our mind of oh my gosh I have to make this decision right now. If your mind isn't ready to weigh the options of whether this is something you feel safe and comfortable doing then you shouldn't be making that decision at that time so urgency doesn't help a situation when the mental wellness of all involved might be wavering into some dangerous places. So I, I think it's it's a lot about giving someone the space and time to make that decision and feel truly comfortable within the team in the production. Or I love that urgency is the death of agency. I think that's something that we can all hold on to. And it it speaks to consent, right? And that if someone is not in a mental space where they can make choices about how to move forward, we are taking away autonomy and agency. So to flip this question now to any performers and content creators in the room, do you have any recommendations for working with or under folks who may not be as sensitive to or potentially triggering of depression and these things that we talked about? And this I'll open up to anyone that feels they have something to contribute. Anna, why don't we start with you? Okay. Um, anytime I feel like I'm going to be triggered by a situation um, being a performer, I, I, I'd I rather just say no. Um, there was a time in my career where I didn't feel like I could say no. Um, you know, for fear of not being able to work again or not whatever. Um, and when I was faced in those situations, I, you kind of like disassociate a little bit, um, and just kind of pick out like the positives in the situation. Like, no, I might not like this situation or the person or whatever it is that's triggering me here, but I look fucking good. This is my job. I love doing my job and I'm not going to let X, Y, or Z stop me from having a good time um you don't always have the option to say no I like I I hear people saying that all the time like you can always say you no, you can always say no but but not not all the time you can you know some some factors come into play where the future might not allow it or or whatever um so for the most part I do try to remove myself from triggering situations but in the case that I can't um, like for instance, events, like we have events all the time and uh, that's not a set. Like you might be next to somebody who abused you or somebody you know, or whatever. And in those situations, um, I just make the best of it. I just like, I'm like, hey, I look good. This is a good day. Look at all these people wearing glitter. You know, just focus on the positives. That's so wonderful. And, and it's a great point that there is a lot of messaging around just say no, right? Or it's easy to say no. And that's not always the case in an industry if you're trying to make it, right? You can reduce your access to opportunities. 
um, some powerful people or in positions where we're going to have to interface with them. And so I really appreciate the other end of that is sometimes you're in these situations and how do you find a way to care for yourself and talk yourself through it? And so you talked about a really important performance strategy that a lot of sports psychologists and performance psychologists work around, which is self-talk. How do we talk ourselves through these challenging environments? What is the dialogue? What is the messaging we give to ourselves to get through difficult things? So I really appreciate that. Demora, it looks like you may have some recommendations in this area as well. Um, the thing that I just really wanted to add in is, again, I, I'm in the adult industry, but I'm not one that works with other people and stuff, so I can't speak on all of that. But I have worked with a couple of uh, companies, and I never went anywhere without my husband. So that that way, no matter what, I always had that mental support, that physical support. And I've, where I am with how I do my work, because I am monogamous, so I uh, I don't work with other people very much. And when I do, it's more just like cutesy pictures type thing. Um, I've, with, like I said, the other end of the you can't say no, I am dead set in my ways. Like I have my set boundaries and if they continue to ask me, then I will quickly tell them to fuck off. Because in my head, McDonald's is always hiring. I will always work. I just may not enjoy it as much. So I just make sure that I, before I agree to work with anybody, I make sure that I have researched and things like that. But then also that, I do bring grief with me everywhere so that that way I can make sure that if I am in an uncomfortable situation, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go. Or he can help me get from way up here with my anxiety or depression and help me, okay, well, I think that may just be this. We can work on that. And so that that way I don't have to feel like I have to be like, okay, well, I would really rather not do that. And then they can't, they're less likely to get pushy with me of setting my boundaries if I have someone with me to back me up. So maybe, maybe that's something I don't know how everybody works and things like that, but maybe that's something that could potentially. Great. Thank you, Damara. At this point in the panel, what I'd like to invite, if there's any participants that are tuning in, if you have any questions for a specific panelist or the panel overall, go ahead and throw those in the Q&A. And while we may not be able to get to each of them, I will call on some of those questions for the panel. Um, at this point, what I want to do, we've got about 20 minutes and I want to make sure we get at least one more chance to hear from everyone. And so the last formal question I have for the panel is, if for everyone, any final takeaways for the audience on depression in the industry? If there was sort of one message you wanted to land with people and to take away from this panel, what would it be? And so we will go around each panelist and I'll monitor if there's any questions coming in through the Q&A. So Carly, welcome back. I'm sorry you had some tech issues. Are you able to hear us okay? looking like probably not. So hopefully we'll get Carly back here soon. But why don't we start with um, Eva, what do you have in terms of final takeaways for the audience? And uh, I want to especially thank you for joining us at 3am. I know you noted that. So um, let's hear from you first. Uh, the first thing that I would like to say is keep an eye on technology. Because it's uh, nowadays, starting from pandemic, it's the biggest trigger of depression and anxiety that we have. And only now, only two years ago, the uh, scientific empirical research started on this topic. And they proved that technology actually affects negatively. Of course, there are positive uh, effects, but... Uh, uh, the video conferencing, for example, if we're speaking about uh, streaming fatigue, affects on burnout it causes burnout it causes depression and cause it causes anxiety uh, on different reasons so be aware that it's not your imagination that you think after streaming you feel bad it's not only members that communicate or not communicate with you because it's also the reason of triggering sometimes uh, for introverts, for example, who are highly depending on nonverbal cues and they are not receiving those cues 
via video conferencing, it actually triggers in them anxiety and depression. Be aware, it's not your imagination. It's our physiology. It's our anatomy. Unfortunately, it's our nature. You are not imagining it. It's, it, it has its scientific basis. And second thing is about um, our individual um, peculiarities, let's call it so. Uh, it is very helpful to be aware of your personal traits, uh, like, for example, neuroticism, which uh, naturally causes a lot of negative effects. And when you dive into streaming or to any content uh, creation um, in this sensitive field, it only gets worse because many things can be stigmatized, many things can actually trigger and on the basis of natural, your natural neuroticism, it can be worse. So do breaks, quit being workaholic. It's a thing that actually only makes it work worse. Don't think that you are the person who will earn all the money in the world working 27 hours per day. If you know of yourself being a little bit neurotic, don't dig yourself a big dark hole to fall. That's my advice. Wonderful. Touched on some really great points there of just protecting your energy, right? And maybe that's on set, maybe it's off of set. Also touching on stigma in the industry and how that's still very pervasive, especially when we come to mental health. And lastly, touching on the importance of intersecting identities and that neurodivergency and other identities that we might hold might intersect with things like depression and our work on set. So thank you for those takeaways. Next, we'd like to hear from Arainier. Any final takeaways or recommendations from you? Yeah, I would like to uh, remind everyone, both creators, producers, uh, that we are people, right? <laughs> We're all human. Um, we all have feelings and emotions and needs and wants and desires. And sometimes... Um, um, I, we're all out here to make money, right? But I'm not out here to make money above someone else's mental or physical health. Um, so I feel like we all need to give each other a break sometimes and believe that we are all trying to do the best for each other and schedule in some you time in your diary and literally write it down like you would any other job. I think Nigel touched on that in the previous uh, uh, panel conversation. Um, but yeah, scheduling you time where you can take care of yourself and do your self-care, I think, is is a really important thing I feel like everyone should be doing. So that's my takeaway. Wonderful. Thank you. Let's go to Finney next. Any final takeaways from you? Um, it's OK to feel the feels, one. Um, you don't have to fight it you, you, because a lot of times when you do, it um, you're just sweeping on the rug and you're building a big mountain. So it's it's still there. And at some point, it'll just kind of like force itself out. So it's okay to feel the feels. It's okay to, you know, talk about it with somebody. Or, you know, um, Pineapple Support also is here for you. Um, depression is common. So don't think that it's something like, oh, I can't believe I'm the only person going through this. No, trust. We all deal with it in some way, shape, or form. Um, but the most important thing to remember that a lot of times we forget doing what we do and always being busy is that our mental and emotional health is just as important as physical and everything else. Yeah, very key, very key. Anna, from you next, final takeaways. I'm just going to piggyback off of what everybody else is saying is basically like you're not alone. Uh, we are on Earth and as beautiful as this planet is, it's full of shit. So, you know, everybody's going to get hit with some shit sometimes and just carry some wet naps, preferably the, the non-flushable kind, you know, just don't put them in the toilet. But yeah, you're not alone. You know, we all got some shit and it's OK. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Just normalizing that this is a part of the human experience and that we get through it. Wonderful. Sabian, what do you have for us? Uh, I guess uh, it's also important to uh, disconnect from online life and have some actual life 
like outside of industry, ideally, because, you know, uh, we tend to forget that it's still work. And since we do a lot of physical work, uh, it's sometimes challenging to find the time to actually do the physical stuff for your own pleasure and for your own fulfillment. So the, it's important, especially when you're single, to not forget to take time off from work and do stuff for fun. Uh, and feel the feelings, be a normal flirt, date, wank, cry wank sometimes if you need to, <laughs> you know, whatever makes you uh, connect back with your body, because our work tends to disconnect us from our bodies and make us feel like we are just a product. Oh yeah, I do cry wanks all the time, Kelly. Uh, lately, I'm, the, I'm a queen of cry wanks under the shower. Uh, they're great. Uh, wet as fuck uh, but uh, technically uh, let's remember that we are not just a product let's let's stop making uh, ourselves just as a business plan or just as a product or just uh, like you know putting ourselves only for money it's kind of draining the most and it makes you like dehumanize yourself to the extent that uh, make you really weird out by like a uh, rest of the world so having a little bit of your own time and just having fun and just enjoying the pleasure of sex, not for money, but for yourself is extremely important. Wow. Great, great takeaway, Sabia. And I think a good wake up call and wake up reminder for everyone is that like we are not just products, not just performers, and that there are whole humans behind the camera and prioritizing that human part of ourselves is just as important. Tamora, what do you have for us for a final takeaway? Uh, like Savian was saying, we're not everybody's cup of tea, not everybody's going to like us, but as long as we can like ourselves, that's what matters in the end. Um, I think that is very, very important. And I tell people that all the time because um, people try to push the, I'm your paycheck and you have to do what I want. But no, I'm a person before I'm your your pleasure. So if you don't like it, go find someone else. There's millions of us about. Um, and just give ourselves grace, give other people grace and try and hold on to that silver lining and don't let the depression win. <laughs> find someone to talk to, write it down, burn it, whatever you need to, not a house, but <laughs> the letter, let me correct. <laughs> um, but yeah, just, I, I've been working really hard myself on giving myself grace and understanding that sometimes it's okay to just not want to be more. I, I have to flip my switch, my compartmentalize. So, thank you guys. Great, great recommendations on kind of protecting your peace and your space. Wonderful. So Laura, we'll hear from you last and then we have a great question in the chat I will get to next. So final takeaways from you, Laura. Yeah, I mean, have have a ritual of play unconventional i mean i'm someone like i've tried meditation and breathing in this and that and i've, I've tried it all and it, it it's hard sometimes it's fucking paralyzing sometimes when it's really heavy and so it took me a little while but i realized unconsciously when i'm in the thick of it and it's it's this fog i can't move through I do the weirdest thing and it saves my life every time. And you've got to find what that weird thing is for you because I don't have the singing voice of Whitney Houston, but when I'm feeling fucking low and I am feeling fucking thick with hurt and pain and depression, I take my remote control and I turn the lights down and I turn on some Whitney Houston. I turn on some Aretha Franklin. I turn on some Dinah Washington and I lip sync the shit out of that. And I breathe where that singer is breathing. And I emote and gesture as if I'm entertaining the world's biggest audience and it's for no one but me. And then by the end of it, I feel fucking magical. So I don't know, find a weird ritual that works for you. That makes me feel twinkly as hell. <laughs> Love that. Love that. And just personalizing what our strategies are, right? We provided a lot of great recommendations in this panel, but not everything's going to stick with each person. So it's finding what works for you. What is the thing that makes you feel alive, makes you feel at peace? 
Wonderful. So I want to make sure we get to this question before we wrap up. So this question is from Nigel. And Nigel stated that he appreciates Anna and Demora's insights around the consequences of saying no in the industry. He's curious if anyone on the panel sees that changing in the future, either industry wide or on certain sets and with certain studios. If not, what can be done to help make that systemic change? So let's hear from a couples on solutions, which I think is so important when we talk about these topics is what could change? What could be a solution? So to, if raise your hand if you feel like you have something to contribute to. Do we see this changing? And if not, what could be done to change it? All right, Ava, go ahead. It won't change itself. It's only us who will change it. How I see it now, there are different flashes and different parts of the world, of the country, of the world. The bigger the flashes are, with time they combine in a one big light. It's only us who can make that change. And by these summits and by bringing it to general public, by changing the attitude of the general public we are actually doing it unfortunately some activists make it worse uh trying to burn the witches but for me it's not the reason to give up yes it can change it's a really 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 hard work work to do but we're not going to give up wonderful i appreciate that sabian So technically, I think uh, already during coronavirus, it started to sl slowly, but uh, pretty strongly changing since uh, we sort of enter an uh, era of power to creator um, because naturally we've been forced to sit home. So studios didn't shoot anything else, but bought, bought like the home content and such. Um, and technically people start to moving towards, you know, only fans and such, what means again, home content, power to creator and so on. Uh, now we have a lot of websites that are run by creators and I have to admit the difference in working between, um, shooting for a creator based website, but where like, for example, Ricky's room also, uh, they, they are creators themselves, they are performing themselves. So they do understand the other side of the work. They are not just there to uh, wrap it up really quickly. They don't look at the clock. They don't make it mechanical. Like European market is pretty well known for doing everything extremely like, so now 15 minutes of cowgirl, now 20 minutes of uh, anal in this in this position and whatever, whatever. It was very like mechanical. Right now, everything changed because there is more and more and more uh, creators who start to build the websites, who become producers themselves, like even me. Um, we producing content differently because we do understand how it feels. We do understand what is the factors of good scene and good scene will never be um, possible if the talent doesn't feel the chemistry, if the talent doesn't feel safe, if the talent doesn't feel like they actually enjoy themselves on the set. And the same thing is with the fans. Fans will never enjoy the same way a scene that is so mechanical. Okay, slides, quality of the camera and so and so, all important. But at this point, we already reached the moment when as a creators, independent creators, we can supply uh, our fans with top quality content and produce on the same level as Brothers or any other big company there. But uh, we do understand the needs of the, of the talent. We do cast talent that we know that will work with each other well. We do like checks on it and we try to cater towards um, human needs on set because if talent is hungry, if talent is just exhausted, if talent is stressed, scene will be shit, <laughs> period. So I think technically we are already doing big steps and it's kind of evolving more and more and more because also fans saw the difference. What means the market is also shaping the need of very good quality ethical porn. Um, and now we mostly, uh, a lot of us mostly do the uh, exchange of the content. So we all have one goal, not to finish scene as soon as possible. The goal is to create good quality, nice scene that actually everybody on set enjoy and uh, nothing can beat 
that type of porn like there is no such a thing like I can't even imagine watching porn when people are actually suffering to be there and because you can easily catch the emotions of the talent when you watch it you can literally see them suffering sometimes and it's just so off turning like there's very little people who can actually go on that type of stuff and there is already way too much produced or by by now so uh, I think we are on very good um, rampage to get actually very good ethical porn soon being the main main source of good ones. <laughs> Thank you, Fabian. I just love the energy, right? When we start talking about change and solutions, what that brings out in people. Also some great points in the chat. Make sure to check those out. And then I want to want to end with one more response from Anna. So what do you want to leave us with? I agree wholeheartedly with Sabian and what you said. I have to thank whoever created COVID because it was the best thing for the industry. Like I feel I feel like the major companies still produce in the way that they they have, and I feel like they always will. But with the change of the the talent, the creators, us having the power, we don't have to rely on companies that won't listen to your boundaries that want you to lose weight that don't want you to have so many tattoos that want your hair a certain length or whatever you know we we don't have to cater to those people that don't cater to us anymore so i am a hundred a hundred and ten percent proud of all of the the per performers that i see becoming producers like it's really competitive now where at the award shows almost half if not more of the directors are our talent and i think that makes a big difference in, in how we're taken care of how we're treated how we're respected and 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 again how we fuck like uh like you said fabian working for ricky's room organic you can't even you can't script that shit and like the more companies that switch over to just like letting the talent fuck for fuck's sake and not making a stepsister whatever the fucks you know it's going to be better. So I'm very thankful for this time in porn. I can't wait for the change to continue to become bigger and all that jazz. So if everybody and anybody wants to produce, put your foot in it, put your passion in it, put your heart in it, because we all appreciate it. That's uh, it. Awesome. <laughs> Well, it is, a, it's a challenge to keep everyone this many amazing responses, this many amazing folks on this panel. It's a challenge. I want to hear from everyone all day. We did a great job of keeping it on the hour. So I just want to thank each and every one of our panelists for everything that you shared today. Um, these are the changes that are needed in the industry. And when it comes to mental health in the industry, these are the conversations that need to be happening. So for those of you that were able to join us, um, those of you that might be watching this recording later, if you want to learn more about any of these wonderful panelists, if you go to the, the website for the Pineapple Support Mental Health Summit, you can get some links to each of these content creators, each of these producers and network and collaborate and share opinions and share support. It's all so important. And I, of course, need to mention that we're doing this again tomorrow. So we'll have a similar panel. I believe some of our panelists will actually be with us tomorrow as well. And we'll have some new faces. So same time. Um, same link. Join us tomorrow. We'll be talking a little bit more about anxiety in the industry and what that looks like. So I will turn it back over to Kelly. And just again, thank you to each of our panelists and everyone that was able to tune in today.